Welcome to everyone to Understanding the Basics of Pesticides. My name is Audrey Thompson and I'm a staff attorney here with the Penn State Center for Agricultural and Shale Law. Today's webinar is part of the Center's Understanding Agricultural Law series, a course designed to provide subject matter literacy and competence on fundamental issues of agricultural law to attorneys and business advisors who work with or represent agricultural or rural clients, but who may not necessarily specialize in agricultural law. This series is wholly sponsored by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture's Ag Business Development Center, established through the 2019 Pennsylvania Farm Bill. The Agricultural Business Development Center aims to enhance the long-term vitality of Pennsylvania farms by supporting farm transitions, both from generation to generation and from conventional to organic farming, supporting beginning farmers, providing risk management education, and providing financial assistance through low interest loans and grants. As you can see, next slide, we have covered numerous topics so far, including ag labor, land use regulation, crop insurance, cons conservation programs, ag finance, Pennsylvania's clean and green, um, and many, many others. Materials and recordings of all of those webinars can be found on our Understanding Agricultural Law landing page on our website at aglaw.psu.edu. We've got upcoming topics uh, next month and the next couple months here for the Understanding the Basics of Ag Law series. Those include federal and state seed laws in October, the Fair Labor Standards Act in November, and the Perishable Agricultural Commodities Act in December. Those are all on Fridays. They're all at noon, and registration is up and available for all of them on our events page. We have also have a couple of other upcoming presentations I just wanted to make you aware of. We've got our regular um, quarterly dairy legal webinar. That focus topic is going to be risk management and income revenue protection. That's on October 17th. Then on October 25th and 26th, we are partnering with some outside organizations for some programming. On the 25th will be the Medicaid Look Back program presented by McGregor Brillhart. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly from Stock and Leader in partnership with PA FarmLink. This is going to be great information for anyone who's interested in or might be dealing with farm tra transition or estate planning issues. Understanding that five-year look back window is um, for Medicaid qualification is crucial to asset protection. So we invite you to join us there. That'll be online and in person. And then on the 26th will be a presentation by Senior Deputy Attorney General Robert Willig in partnership with the Pennsylvania Agricultural Ombudsman Program. That will be in person in Williamsport from 10.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. And I will have more information on that up on our webpage early next week. We're, we're still working on the final details um, with that organization. So that'll be available on our website. And then finally, just a couple of reminders before we get started here with pesticides, this webinar is being recorded. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat, or sorry, in the Q&A feature, not the chat, in the Q&A. I will collect those at the end and do ask questions, please. We wanna have a dialogue as much as possible in this webinar format. All right, I will now turn this webinar over to Chloe Marie. Chloe is a research specialist with the Penn State Center for Agricultural and Shale Law. She holds a Bachelor of Law and Master of Law degree, um, sorry, Bachelor of Law and Master of Law degrees from the University of Paris in France and holds an LLM from Penn State Dickinson Law with a focus on energy and natural resources. Chloe is the principal contributor to and manager of the center's issue trackers and virtual resource rooms, which include compilations on glyphosate, chlorpyrifos, dicamba, and pesticide drift issues. Chloe, Chloe, can't talk anymore. Chloe, the screen is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Audrey. All right, welcome to this webinar on the basics of pesticides. Um, so pesticides are a broad and complex topic. There is a lot to say here. And today we will cover uh, a spectrum of regulatory and legal topics, including uh, key concepts, such as pesticide definitions, types uh, and uses, and the potential adverse effects of using pesticides uh, in agriculture. We will also talk about pesticide registration and labeling, certification and licensing requirements for pesticide applicators and worker protection standards against uh, pesticide exposure. And finally, we will discuss uh, the legal concerns and tort protection associated with pesticide drift. And hopefully by the end of this webinar, you will have a better understanding of the basics of pesticides and the importance of pesticide laws and regulations. So let's begin. Um, and first let's define what we mean by pests and pesticides. So a pest is any organism that is 
detrimental to humans, their property, or the environment. And this includes insects, rodents, fungi, weeds, viruses, bacteria, and other microorganisms. As for pesticide, um, a Pesticide is a generic term that includes a wide variety of chemicals and compounds uh, used to kill pests, and they are generally classified by the type of pest they control, for example, insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, or rodenticides, or by the chemical composition. Um, and there is a difference between general use and restricted use pesticides. So general use pesticides are available to the general public at retail garden stores. They do not require a license to purchase or use. And uh, a good example of general use pesticides that I'm sure you all know um, include Roundup products. And then restricted use pesticides. Um, so they have the potential to harm people uh, and the environment and they are only available to certified applicators. So now that we have defined pests and pesticides, um, let's explore uh, some key facts and figures about pesticide use in agriculture. So according to uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, in 2021, global pesticide consumption in agriculture reached 3.53 million metric tons, showing a 4% increase compared to the previous year, so 2020. Uh, Brazil was the world's uh, largest pesticide user in 2021, with approximately 720,000 metric tons used, followed closely by the United States, which ranked as the uh, second largest pesticide consuming country at around 457,000 metric tons. And according to the U.S. Geological Geological Survey, um, we were looking at approximately 1 billion pounds of pesticides uh, being used in U.S. agriculture each year. And when you look at the latest data from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, it is clear that corn, soybeans, uh, cotton, wheat, and potatoes are the big players when it comes to pesticides, uh, pesticide use. And as of the latest information available from the uh, EPA's active pesticide product registration informational listing, um, there are over 33,000 registered pesticide products authorized for use, uh, for use in the United States uh, as of yesterday. Um, so in our current society, uh, the use of pesticides in agriculture sparks a multitude of questions and concerns. Uh, we wonder about their impact on human health and the environment. Um, it is not uncommon to find uh, traces of these chemicals in the air, water, and even in the food we eat. So naturally, this raises alarms um, among consumers who worry about their intake of pesticides. And one important concern is that despite our good understanding of how pesticides affect the human body in the short term, we are still a bit in the dark about the long-term um, effects on both human health and the environment. Though pesticide use uh, has been linked to a number of health problems, um, including cancer, neurological disorders, and reproductive issues. Um, in addition, pesticides can harm non-target organisms as they can extend beyond their intended application areas and can find their way into the environment through contamination of air, water, or soil. And some studies have shown that pesticides um, carried by dust particles can rise to high altitudes and travel long distances, eventually descending as rain, snow, or fog. Um, and water sources are also not immune to contamination, often due to drift or runoff. And research has indicated a correlation between pesticide use and a decline in biodiversity. So despite these concerns, pesticides bring substantial benefits to the table. They protect crops against pests, diseases, and weeds, uh, which translates into increased crop yields and more affordable food prices, which is um, a critical consideration in today's world. Um, it's a delicate balancing act between these advantages and potential drawbacks that we uh, must navigate um, carefully. So as we've seen, 
pesticides are widely used in agriculture, both globally and in the United States. However, as I've just mentioned, pesticide use can also have negative impacts on human health and the environment. This is why it is important to have laws and regulations in place to govern the use of pesticides. In the, in the US, pesticides are subject to regulations under two primary laws, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide and Rodenticide Act, also known as FIFRA, and the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. So FIFRA requires all pesticides to be registered by the EPA before they can be sold or distributed in the United States. The EPA evaluates the safety and effectiveness of each pesticide to ensure that it will not pose an unreasonable risk to human health and or the environment. And the Food, uh, Drug and Cosmetic Act requires the EPA to set tolerances for pesticide residues on food. So both these laws have been amended several times over the years to reinforce the safety standards for pesticides. Um, for example, the Food Quality Protection Act, uh, which was adopted in 19, uh, 1996, um, requires the EPA to use a higher standard of safety um, when evaluating a new pesticide, which is known as the reasonable certainty of no harm standard, and to reassess existing pesticides to make sure they meet the new standard. Um, and in addition to FIFRA, the Food Drug and Cosmetic Act um, and the Food Quality Protection Act, there are a number of other laws and regulations that govern the use of pesticides in the United States. The Endangered Species Act requires the EPA to make sure that pesticides do not harm endangered or threatened species. And the Clean Water Act regulates the discharges of pesticides into water bodies. And many states also have their own laws and regulations that govern pesticide use. So under FIFRA, to register a pesticide, the applicant must provide a certain amount of administrative information and scientific data, and that include the applicant's identity, name, address, authorized agent, if any, company number, a summary of the application, including a list of all the data submitted and a brief description of the results of all tests uh, conducted. A draft label with claims, which are statements uh, that the pesticide can or should be used uh, to prevent or destroy a specific pests. Ingredient statements, warnings, precaution statements, and directions for use. And all applicable data required to support uh, the registration application. Once pesticide data is submitted to the EPA, it is used to complete risk assessments and write instructions for how to use it safely. Uh, the data must answer questions about the pesticide's chemistry, how well it works, and how it might affect people, animals, plants, uh, and the environment. And applicants must demonstrate to the EPA that the pesticide will perform its intended function without unreasonable risk to people or the environment. And this, this evaluation considers the economic, social, and environmental costs and benefits associated with the use of pesticide. And there are several types of pesticide registrations, including unconditional, conditional, and supplemental registrations. Um, so the EPA will approve the unconditional registration of pesticide product when all FIFRA requirements have been satisfied all required data has been submitted, and the EPA determines that the use of the product will not result in unreasonable adverse effects on either the people or the environment. Now, the EPA will grant a conditional registration to a pesticide product uh, when it needs more information and data to decide about the product's safety and effectiveness, but has determined that the benefits of making the product available for use outweigh the risks. And the applicant must provide additional data to the EPA within a specified time frame. If the applicant fails to submit the required data or if the data shows that the product does not meet the registration uh, criteria, the EPA may cancel the registration. And finally, um, a pesticide supplemental registration is a type of pesticide uh, registration 
um, that allows a company to distribute and sell their registered pesticide product under another company or supplier's name and address. This supplemental registration allow companies to add more products to their lineup without going through the registration process again, which is known to be quite uh, lengthy and expensive. And prior to uh, 1996, uh, pesticide registrations lasted for only five years. Uh, now pesticide registrations must be renewed every 15 years. This means that the EPA is responsible for determining whether any registered pesticide product poses new public health or environmental risks that may no longer be acceptable to the public. Uh, and if no request for renewal is received within 30 days prior to the end of the registration period, the EPA is required to publish a notice of cancellation in the Federal Register. And manufacturers have 30 days to challenge the proposed uh, cancellation. So as we have just covered the federal processes and regulations surrounding uh, pesticide product registration, it is important to recognize that the oversight of pesticide extends beyond uh, the federal level. States also play a significant role in regulating pesticide. Uh, and under Section 24C of FITRA, states have a regulatory authority to register any additional uses for pesticides that are already federally registered. More precisely, uh, Section 24C allows states to amend federal pesticide labels to meet their special local needs, which can include agricultural, environmental, or public health needs. For a pesticide to be registered under Section 24C, a state must submit a request to the EPA. The request must include information about the pesticide, the proposed amendment, and the data that supports the amendment. The EPA will then review the request and decide whether to grant approval. And under uh, Section 24A of FIFRA, EPA also grants states the authority to regulate pesticide use through state legislation or rulemaking procedures if they want to modify and restrict the permitted uses stated on a pesticide uh, label. And once a state registers uh, a pesticide, it has primary enforcement authority to monitor the use of the pesticide and ensure compliance with federal pesticide regulations and standards. And in that regard, each state Department of Agriculture must develop a pesticide program, including the following key components, label requirements, worker protection standards, pesticide applicator certification and training requirements, and record keeping, which we'll review in a minute. Um, so a couple of things I want to point out is that federal law controls pesticide labels. This means that state pesticide requirements can be stricter than federal requirements, but not less strict. Um, and if a state fails to meet minimum federal requirements, the EPA may withdraw the state's um, primacy to regulate pesticide use. Additionally, states cannot impose labeling requirements that are different from the ones required under FIFRA. So now that we have explored how states exercise their regulatory um, authority in pesticide product registration, let's shift our attention to another essential aspect of pesticide use that is closely intertwined with this um, state level processes. Um, pesticide labeling requirements play an important role in ensuring the safe and effective use of pesticides and understanding them is essential for federal and state compliance. So the, the pesticide label is the legal document that provides specific instructions on how to use a pesticide safely and effectively. Uh, the pesticide label must include the following information, the brand name, product type, EPA registration number, manufacturer name and address, ingredient statement, signal words indicating toxicity, precautionary statements, recommendations for personal protective equipment, environmental hazard warnings, first aid instructions, directions for use, and storage and disposal guidelines. It is important to note that the pesticide label is the law. This means that if you fail to comply with the label requirements, you will be in violation of FIFRA and applicable state law. And as we've seen, the pesticide label serves as the legal framework governing pesticide use, 
but compliance with these labels often goes on in hand in hand uh, with the knowledge and qualifications of those who handle them. Uh, under FIFRA, anyone who applies or supervises the use of restricted use uh, pesticide must be certified as a private or commercial applicator. As I've quickly already covered, restricted use pesticides or pesticides that are considered to be more hazardous, dangerous than general use pesticides, and, re and they require additional training and certification for uh, safe and effective use. Individuals who apply restricted use pesticides uh, for the production of agricultural commodities on their own or leased land are required to obtain private uh, pesticide applicator certification. And for example, farmers and their employees will fall under that category. Um, and then individuals who apply restricted use pesticide to properties other than their own and for compensation must hold a pesticide applicator license as well as an applicator business license. For example, a pest control company that applies pesticides to homes and businesses. Uh, under the EPA standards for certification of private applicators, private applicators must be a minimum of 18 years old and successfully pass a Raiden examination. So private applicators must demonstrate core knowledge that they can read and understand pesticide labels and instructions, recognize pesticide risks and take necessary uh, safety precautions, understand the environmental impacts of pesticide use and misuse, properly identify target pests and select suitable pesticides, select and maintain appropriate equipment, choose the application method that is most effective and least harmful to the environment, and comply with state, travel, and federal pesticide regulations. Now, similar to private applicators, uh, commercial applicators must be at least 18 years old and successfully pass uh, a Raiden examination, demonstrating the core knowledge of pest control and the effective use of restricted uh, use pesticides. In addition, commercial applicators are required to demonstrate knowledge in at least one specific category of pesticide application. The category examination focuses on subjects relevant to the specific type of pesticide application for which the applicator seeks uh, certification. For example, someone who wants to apply pesticides for forest pest control would need to successfully complete the forest pest control category examination. And states are allowed to certify um, individuals for the application of restricted use pesticide, provided they have an EPA approved plan uh, detailing the certification process. So states must meet or exceed EPA standards and may require additional certification requirements for specific pesticide applications. In some states, private and commercial applicators might need to complete a specific number of continuing education hours every few years to um, maintain their certification. And, oh, we're missing a slide. Oh, no, on this slide. Um, here's some information about the Pennsylvania Pesticide Certification Plan for uh, those who are interested. Uh, in Pennsylvania, the State Department of Agriculture operates the pesticide certification program. Um, private applicators who apply restricted use uh, fumigants must secure a special permit for that specific type of fumigation. Additionally, there are 26 distinct uh, categories for commercial applicators. And to keep their certification valid, all applicators must complete continuing education units training every three years and earn PDA approved recertification credits. So um, pesticides can be harmful to both human health and the environment if they're not used properly. I cannot stress that enough. An individual most susceptible to exposure, uh, including pesticide applicators and agricultural workers, may experience a variety of health issues such as respiratory problems, skin irritation, and chronic illnesses. Um, in light of these concerns, employers must take steps to protect their employees from pesticide exposure, ensuring both worker safety and compliance with federal and state regulations. 
So in uh, 1992, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency adopted the Worker Protection Standard Regulations, which were designed to protect the health and safety of workers who come into contact with pesticides. And the agency uh, um, subsequently updated the regulation in 2015. So under the WPS regulations, employers must give their employees, whether they are agricultural workers or pesticide applicators, proper safety training. This training includes understanding pesticide labels, how to safely handle pesticides, using personal protective equipment, and recognizing potential safety risks. Agricultural workers who do not handle pesticides directly and pesticide applicators will perform tasks involving direct contact with pesticides, such as mixing, loading, applying, and equipment maintenance, must both receive annual EPA-approved WPS training. Additionally, they must be trained before entering areas uh, where pesticides were used or where a restricted entry interval was in effect in the past uh, 30 days. And uh, for reference, a restricted entry interval refers to the time after applying pesticides when workers cannot enter uh, treated areas to reduce exposure risk. Um, employers also require to display essential pesticide information that must be accessible to employees during work hours. This information, uh, including hazard data from the safety data sheets, must be posted for 30 days following a pesticide application or the restricted entry interval. And it should also include emergency medical facility details and contact information uh, for pesticide regulation agencies. Pesticide application specifics must also be available, describing the treated area, pesticide names and active ingredients, EPA registration numbers, application dates and times, and duration of the restricted entry interval. And pesticide information must be posted within 24 hours of application, and records must be kept for a period of two years. Then employers must provide their employees with personal protective equipment, including chemical-resistant aprons, footwear, uh, headgear and suits, coveralls, gloves, and protective eyewear. Pesticide applicators must have a design, uh, designated area separate from pesticide storage and use where they can store uh, their personal uh, belonging uh, that they do not wear during pesticide handling activities. They must put on their uh, protective equipment at the beginning of any period with potential pes um, pesticide exposure and remove it uh, at the end, again, of any period of uh, with potential pesticide exposure. And last, uh, employers must ensure that the contamination supplies are available within a quarter mile of the work area for specified duration after the work period ends. This supplies must include soap, disposable towels, at least three gallons of water per worker for regular or emergency washing, and a fresh set of clothes. Pesticide applicators have the responsibility to ensure that pesticides are used safely this means reading, understanding, and following all the directions and restrictions on the pesticide level because uh, pesticide level is the law. And employers who violate the WPS may face a range of penalties from warning notices to civil and criminal penalties. And workers who are injured due to pesticide exposure may be able to file uh, workers' compensation claims against their employers. Um, so one more thing about the worker protection standard. In November 2015, the US EPA revised uh, the standard regulations to include new application exclusion uh, zone requirements to protect people of the farm boundaries from pesticide drift during and after application. So the application exclusion zone uh, is a designated area around a pesticide application site where individuals are prohibited from entering both during um, and for a specified period of time following the application. Uh, so the application uh, exclusion zone must be established before the application begins and must stay in place until the restricted entry interval is over. 
Um, so the zone varies from a uh, 100 foot or 25 foot buffer zone around pesticide application equipment, depending on the application method. Um, for example, the application exclusion zone is a 100 foot buffer zone uh, around the pesticide equipment for uh, aerial, air blast and fumigants applications. And for ground-based uh, pesticide applications sprayed from more than 12 inches above the soil, the application exclusion zone is a 25-foot buffer around the application equipment. And in October 2020, the US EPA uh, narrowed the scope of uh, the zone requirements to apply only to the agricultural employer's property, excluding people on neighboring properties. Um, however, on December 29, 2020, the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York issued a stay on the rules implementation, and the decision came in response to uh, two petitions uh, filed challenging uh, the 2020 rule and its limited scope of applicability. And more recently, in March 2023, the U.S. EPA proposed a rule to reinstate uh, the, the 2015 uh, provisions, once again, extending the coverage to include people outside the farm uh, boundaries to protect them from pesticide drift. Um, so the public comment period closed um, last May. Uh, so stay tuned for further developments. Uh, so now coming back to the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. Um, as I've just mentioned earlier, this act sets tolerances or limits uh, for pesticide residues on food based on available scientific data to ensure that humans are exposed to safe levels of pesticides. So pesticide tolerance is the maximum amount of pesticide residue that is allowed on food for specific pesticide commodity uh, combination. A pesticide may have different tolerances on different foods and vice versa. A particular food may have different tolerances uh, for different pesticides. So if a pesticide has the potential to leave a residue in a food item, uh, then the EPA must establish a tolerance. The EPA would only set a tolerance if it has determined uh, um, that the current or proposed uses of the pesticide represent a reasonable certainty of no harm. And to set a tolerance, the EPA must demonstrate that consumers' exposure to the pesticide represents a, res a reasonable certainty of no harm. In doing so, EPA must consider the following factors, potential impacts on infants and children, aggregate exposure, which is the, uh, the exposure from food, water, and the residential environment, cumulative exposure, which is the exposure uh, to the entire toxicity of the pesticide family, not just the uh, individual pesticide. And if a pesticide applicator uses the pesticide properly, the residue level should not exceed uh, the tolerance. And foods with pesticide residues above the tolerance may not be imported or sold in interstate commerce. All right, so having discussed uh, various pesticide laws and regulations, let's now address um, the legal liability aspects of pesticide manufacturing and handling, specifically in the uh, context of pesticide drift. Um, so people can be exposed to potential harmful pesticides at home, work, uh, and outside. For example, you might use pesticides uh, in your garden, work as a gardener, for a city or private company, walk in a public park where pesticides were used, or simply live next to a farm. And you can also be exposed to pesticides through your food and water. And pesticide drift is one of the most common reported issues in the agricultural community that can seriously damage uh, neighboring properties. And there are a few reasons why pesticides can drift. Um, pesticide maybe uh, might be sprayed outside of the target area either accidentally or due to equipment problems. Wind can carry pesticide droplets off the target area um, and rain or irrigation water can wash pesticides off the target area. So farmers, pesticide applicators and uh, pesticide manufacturers can be held legally liable, um, liable for pesticide uh, drift. 
as I've already said, um, farmers and pesticide applicators bear the responsibility of ensuring the safe use of pesticides in accordance with uh, the label. While pesticide manufacturers might face liability for pesticide drift if their product is defective and if they fail to warn users about the potential risks associated with pesticide drift. So there are generally four main uh, legal theories under which lawsuits can be filed against pesticide applicators for damages. A landowner whose property is damaged by non-target pesticide application can file liability claims alleging strict liability, trespass, nuisance, and negligence. Negligence being the most common legal theory used in pesticide drift lawsuits, trespass, nuisance, uh, and strict liability claims are less likely to be successful because they tend to be a bit more difficult um, to prove. So let's start with strict uh, liability. So strict liability is a legal theory that holds someone liable for damages caused by their abnormally dangerous activities, even if they were not negligent. In a strict liability case, the injured party does not have to prove that the defendant was negligent or intended to cause harm. So the key question here is whether applying pesticides can qualify as an ultra hazardous activity. Uh, and in Pennsylvania, for example, there is no explicit law that defines whether damages from pesticide uh, application count as strict liability torts. Therefore, we must turn uh, to the courts for guidance. Um, so the federal some examples here. The, the Federal District Court for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania found that pesticide application in the home was not uh, an ultra hazardous activity in the case of uh, Velary versus Ter Terminix uh, International. Similarly, the Appellate Division of the New York Supreme Court ruled that pesticide spraying was not an ultra hazardous activity while the Wisconsin Supreme Court ruled that pesticide spraying should not be considered an ultra hazardous activity in Bennett versus uh, Larson Company. However, the uh, Oregon Supreme Court ruled that cross dusting is an ultra hazardous activity. Um, so it can very much vary by states and jurisdiction. Now, a trespass. Trespass is the intentional and physical intrusion upon another person or their property or the intentional introduction of a tangible object onto another person's property without permission that interferes with the owner's exclusive possession of the property. So when it comes to pesticide drift, the mere presence of pesticide molecules on the neighbor's property might be seen as trespass However, because these molecules do not necessarily meet the criteria of a tangible object, it may be difficult to prove intrusion and interference with um, exclusive possession in pesticide drift cases. Now, in Johnson versus uh, Painesville Farmers, the Minnesota Supreme Court ruled that trespass requires invasion by tangible matter. And because pesticide spray drift consists of particulates, matter, the court dismissed the plaintiff's uh, trespass claim, concluding that there was no interference of an exclusive possessory interest. However, in uh, Michael Payne versus Hopper, uh, the Colorado State District Court found that pesticide spray drift amounted to a physical intrusion because the plaintiffs um, had directly experienced the effects of the defendant's uh, spray uh, residue. The court acknowledged uh, the tangible nature of the, of the spray residue and uh, therefore found that it constituted a trespass, even without proof of actual harm. Nuisance is an interference with another person's use and enjoyment of their property. In the case of pesticide application, losing your crops due to the spray of an unwanted pesticide on your land might be uh, a nuisance claim. And again, in Johnson versus Painesville Farmers, uh, the Minnesota Supreme Court acknowledged that uh, nuisance claims can offer remedies for intangible intrusions. 
The court further affirmed that the release of particulate matter can constitute an unreasonable disruption of someone's land use and uh, enjoyment, those qualifying as unreasons. Negligence now. So as I already mentioned, negligence is the most common legal claims when pesticide drift occurs. A person is negligent when they fail to act as a reasonable person would under similar circumstances, and that failure causes harm to another. So under the theory of negligence, you must prove the following elements. A duty of care. The pesticide applicator has a duty to act reasonably to prevent pesticide drift, which includes following the pesticide uh, label instructions. Breach of duty. There is a breach of duty if the pesticide applicator failed to act reasonably to prevent damage from the pesticide. Proximate causation. You must establish uh, proximate causation and show that the injury suffered was a reasonably foreseeable result of the pesticide applicator's misconduct or misuse. And finally, you must prove actual damages from the pesticide application. So an injured party may also file a product liability claim against the pesticide uh, manufacturer, distributor, or seller for damages caused by pesticide drift. As you know, product liability can fall both under uh, negligence and strict liability. Uh, and in usually in pesticide drift lawsuits, product liability is generally associated with negligence claims. So to succeed in your product liability claim, you must show that you were injured due to pesticide exposure and that the manufacturer, distributor, or seller was negligent in some way. And you can show that negligence by establishing either a defect in the design of the entire product line that makes it unreasonably dangerous to the consumer for the intended use, a manufacturing defect in an individual product that makes it unreasonably dangerous to the consumer, or uh, you can establish a failure by the manufacturer or distributor to warn the consumer about any risks associated with the use of product. So now let's look at um, the case of Batter Farms Incorporated versus BSF Corporations. That shows how issues are with pesticide drift uh, can affect um, farming communities. So in this case, a peach farmer in Southeast um, Missouri filed a lawsuit against Monsanto and BSF Corporation seeking financial compensation for crop and peach tree damages uh, caused by that and by drift. So the farmer argued that the, um, the companies were negligent and had violated product liability laws by creating a uh, flawed crop system that destroyed thousands of acres of farmland. He claimed that Monsanto had developed a genetically modified soybean and cotton seeds designed to resist herbicides such as dicamba and glyphosate, but the company had failed to provide a suitable herbicide for these new seeds, and farmers had to resort um, to using older formulations of dicamba, which are more volatile and prone to drift. So in 2015 and 2016, the uh, farmers' peat trees and crops were damaged by dicamba drift from neighboring farms, and the farmer alleged that the companies were aware of the risks of dicamba drift, but failed to warn uh, farmers. Uh, actually, multiple lawsuits were filed against the defendants for dicamba herbicide damage. Um, these federal cases have been combined into the dicamba herbicides multi-district litigation, However, the batter case, so the, the batter case is part of uh, this multi-district litigation, but uh, the plaintiffs chose not to join the master crop damage complaints. Instead, they are pursuing their own legal courts. Um, settlement discussions are uh, currently ongoing, but the batter plaintiffs were not part of these negotiations. And if you want more information about uh, this multi-district litigation case, please visit uh, the Dikemba issue tracker on our website. Now, coming back to the battery case. Um, so a jury awarded the former uh, $15 million in compensatory damages and $250 million in punitive damages against Monsanto and BSF, finding the companies negligent and liable under product liability laws. 
The federal district court, however, later reduced the punitive damages award to $60 million, uh, but it agreed that the companies sold defective and dangerous soybean and cotton seeds, knowing that without a safe herbicide, people might use illegal ones to protect their crops. Um, and the court concluded that Monsanto's actions were reckless and harmful, and the plaintiff should indeed uh, receive punitive damages. So the company appealed the verdict, but the Eighth uh, Circuit Court affirmed the jury's decision in uh, 2022. All right, so that concludes uh, my presentation on the basics of pesticides. And again, for the seeking uh, CLE or PDA credits, the code word is residue. Thank you all for your attention. Great, thank you so much, Chloe. That was amazing. Um, We've got the forms in the chat there. So anyone uh, seeking those credits, please get those filled out. We do have a couple of questions and I'm gonna start with a question from Mary Sprout. And she just says, please say more about signal words on labels. Oh, okay. So there is, I mean, there are plenty of them. I don't have like a specific one in mind except perhaps the one danger. That's a good example, uh, but yeah, they have to be very well displayed on the label. Um, big characters, they have to be there. Is that, and I wish, I, Mary, if you're listening, if you want to add more to this question and we can kind of follow up on this, um, I'm wondering if she means, if she's talking about like, what are the, what are the specific ones? I'm assuming Chloe's, there's probably a list. Yeah, there that. is a list. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, that you can find as part of the code of federal, uh, like in the federal, the code of federal regulations. Yes. Okay. So if anyone wants to do some legal research, the CFR, uh, she's, someone says in the, in the, the signal words are caution, warning, danger, and danger poison. Yeah. And then I'm assuming that they just, they have like a standard for like the font size type. Yeah. That yeah. 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 They're all yeah. regulated yeah. as well. So then people can very easily see them on the bottle of their pesticide. Um, okay. So I hope we addressed that. Um, Great, thank you, Genevieve, for that uh, uh, chime in there. And then we have a, a question from uh, Mr. Atoni, Clay Atoni, and he says, um, when does a substance have to have a label to apply on crops, livestock, et cetera? For example, uh, water is provided without a label. Um, but he says, OA, which is um, oxalic acid, is labeled for bees, but wood bleach, which is uh, uh, OA, is being used since it is cheaper. People should know the label is the law, but what law? What are the consequences of not following the label? Well, again, as I mentioned, um, the if you do not follow uh, the pesticide labels, so uh, the instructions, you may be in violation of uh, federal laws and regulations. So that include FIFRA, but also uh, state laws. Um, you really have to follow the label by the letter. Everything that's in there, you have to do. That's that's very important if you do not want to be uh, held liable. Um, right. I I did a little bit. He um this person sent me this email earlier, and I did a little bit of googling just to try to understand mm. this question so I could ask it better because I I personally did not know what OA was, so I had no, to look neither. that up. And I I came across a couple of resources that um Mr. Tony and anyone else may find um really helpful. I understand that this oxalic acid was, there was a rule published by EPA in February of 2021 that exempted um, it exempted the substance from a requirement of a tolerance. So I think that's where he's going with this. And then it's used, it looks like it's used with honeybees um, and like wood bleach people would use that on the, on the boxes, I believe. So um, I think what he's getting at is, is like, at what point, I think like, why is it, doesn't this have a label? And Clay, if you're listening, if you want to chime in with follow-up to this, um, I'm gonna send you directly these materials that I found online. There's a really good article from a, um, a source called Be Informed and then the, the actual Federal Register posting on this pesticide as well. So um, Chloe, if you have uh, anything to add, or um, Brooke, if you have anything to add, do you wanna chime in here? I was going to add, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, I was going to add, I, I it was hard to get digest that whole question while you were reading it there. Mm -hmm. But 
obviously there's always an issue with um, <clears throat> the pesticide applies for registration for the use that the seller intends it to be used for. Now, when it is used for other purposes, that's a whole nother ballgame. So, um, you know, it, this process that Chloe describes so well is only for the uses intended by the seller. And so that's, you know, the, the restrictions that might appear on the label, et cetera, only apply to the uses for which the seller is, you know, asking to be approved. So when it, a pro, any kind of product, you know, it's all governed by the intended uses. So when any kind of product is used for some other secondary thing that is not on the label, you're deviating from the label. So you're essentially by, you know, per se, violating the label instructions. So you're off the chart, so to speak. You're outside of the regulatory scheme that's in place once you use it for a purpose that is not on the label as an as a as a registered and approved use. Now, did that factor in there uh, to the way he asked that question? Because I did kind of. I, I think so. So my understanding is like, um, OA oxalic acid is is a labeled for bees or proof of bees, but I'm not quite sure that that might be. It, it, anyway, um, but wood bleach is being used predominantly by beekeepers because it is cheaper. So we're using like this substitute, but wood bleach has OA in it is what he's saying. What are the consequences of not following the label? And we've got a lot of um, people chiming in here. This is really great. Um, uh, Bob Mann says there's an ongoing issue with beekeepers using pesticides off label that is addressed in a white paper accessible through the something website. I will look that up and uh, we'll link to it. Sorry for not being more specific. I'll see if I can find that. Um, Clay says, yes, you're correct. What federal law is actually violated and what are the penalties if someone is basically using off label? Let's let's go with that, Chloe. What federal law is violated if someone is using off label? That that would be FIFA. And in terms of the penalties, um, well, they're usually assessed on a case by case basis, uh, depending on the offense. I look into uh, the regulations to see if we had any numbers, but they didn't say. They just say that uh, penalties would be assessed, uh, depending on the the fact the issue. The fines. Yes. <laughs> hey, money. Um, we have another. Oh, thanks, Go Bob. Ahead. That link in the chat there. Great. Off label use. And then we have an anonymous person who says pest control should only be done using registered pesticides. Using items not registered for pesticide use is illegal and also dangerous because those mm -hmm. products may not be exactly the same as the product that it's registered. Does that track with what you're saying, Chloe? Yes. 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 It does. Yeah. Audrey, yeah. there might be an interesting thing that, uh, you know, to, to pick up on where where this is going during the COVID you know uh, 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 pandemic, particularly at the height of it, when there were all these disinfectants that were coming out that because of the concern for the surface transmission, in other words, you know, wiping down, you know, there was that fear at the beginning that this was going to be a, something transmitted by surface contacts and you know touching you know tabletops and and and, and doorknobs and everything else. A ton of these or a whole bunch of these products ended up, you know, applying for pesticide registrations um, because they were being advertised as killing these organisms um, when they were standard disinfectants that were never something that was being, um, uh, you know, marketed in a particular way. And now they were. So they were be you know, companies were being very uh, uh cautious about you know, asking to have them registered. Um, and uh, and I know that the state, for example, got inundated with all sorts of stuff um, that was standardly, you know, not something that would be registered. Um, uh, but because it was being now sold as a surface disinfectant, um, you know, for COVID purposes, they were going out of their way to try to get them registered. Uh, so anyway, uh, just a little tidbit that, that talks about, you know, this whole idea that the intended use of the seller is the really the key to it all. Um, okay, so then I've got another, this is kind of hitting on that, like the the, intended, the intention of the seller is the key to it all. Um, are pesticide applicators permitted to mix different pesticide products? That's an excellent question. I don't have the answer to that one, so I'll be looking into it. Um, if whoever asked that question wants to drop their email address, I'll be happy to 
to look into it and, and follow up. Anonymous attendees. And actually, we have an answer here. Yes, applicators oh. are permitted to thank mix products to reduce applications. They must, however, do a jar test beforehand to make sure those products are compatible. Thank you, Genevieve. Very knowledgeable. Right. Somebody's got their, their hand raised here. Did you see that? Kara? Oh. Yeah. Um, Kara, I don't have a way to, if you would just please put whatever you have in the chat and we will we'll get it in there. Uh, um, Audrey, I think there was one question that Jackie sent in our chat. Yeah, uh, yeah, the question, yeah, yeah, if you want to read that question. Oh, or, yeah. yeah, so I've got, um, would someone who's applying restricted use pesticides need a private certification or commercial certification if they're applying the pesticides on a family member's property, not but not their own property? So that would be um, a private certification right. because they are not a business and also they are not asking for compensation. We got private awesome <laughs> there. And then, oh, uh, Clay says in, in response to the, the mixing question, um, look for on the label if the label um, mm. covers tank mixes. Tank mixes, so, yeah, good one. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, uh, Randall Erst, we will send you yes. an email with- With the link to legal With the link to the, on the, the mixing. We will do that. Okay. Audrey, if you were to, if we have a, I have a short little new subject to just to just, we have two minutes left and no more questions, right? I I think so. Unless if anyone's got anything else, go ahead yeah, and I submit them. I was just going to mention that um, there has been uh, a lot of uh, requests to, um, uh, to have, Pesticide labeling in Spanish made, you know, uh, a mandatory, and that, and and then also, could the training be off? Could the, then the certification training be offered in Spanish? And the um, uh, twenty, uh, no, excuse me, one of the funding bills, and I forget which COVID relief bill it was. If it was the, you know, uh, um, uh, not the IRA, it was probably the one that was right before that. Um, did in fact um, authorize EPA to go ahead and um, start the process, I believe I have this correct, to make uh, pesticide labeling uh, mandatory in Spanish. Um, and so that's opened up, you know, an issue that had long been festering in this world. Um, and, and so that's coming. Um, and I don't exactly know. You have to, in your own individual state or um, here in PA, check with the Bureau of Plant Industry as to where that all stands. But, you know, it, that is a big issue that um, had been circling around in this industry, which is now going forward. Hmm. And there is one comment, actually, from Joni Davis saying that, but not the whole label, only certain sections. So I'm guessing... Uh, it is progress, but not perfection. Okay, got it. And again, Bureau of Plant Industry from PDA would be the people to talk to about all of that. Great. All right. Well, if we don't have any more questions, we are perfect. We are right at one o'clock. I love a timely presentation. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us.